It's Purple Daily on Score North and scorenorth.com. Purple Daily, presented by Surly Brewing Company. Yeah, I think there's a chance that, uh, you know, that he may end up getting some more playing time. He got a couple carries today, I think. And then, uh, <clears throat> you know, he's still a young guy, um, you know, and we brought him in as a kickoff returner and, and a backup running back. So, but he's done a nice job in, in a couple of these, these uh, situations for returning the ball. And welcome in. It's Monday, so it's time for comments from YouTube on Purple Daily, sponsored by, uh, of course, our friends at Surly Brewing and also TCL TV. Enjoy more with TCL. If you're not watching football on a TCL, you're doing it wrong. That was uh, Vikings coach Mike Zimmer talking about Kene Nuwangu, who now has not one but two kickoff returns for touchdowns. Um, and he was doing so in part to a question about the fact that Kane might play more now that Dalvin Cook is out. He is not out for the season, but he does have a torn labrum and a dislocated shoulder. And so he definitely will not play when the Vikings uh, face the Lions in Detroit on Sunday. Zolgad and Declan Goff. And Declan, really, this show is all about you and the viewers. Comments from YouTube. I, I, I like to, I like to tee to the viewers. I, I don't make things about me on this show. Um, you do. Are you doing different I do stuff? In, so in I never know when you're going to programs and aspects of life. Uh, yeah, I don't hide from that necessarily. But I, this is this is the viewers' show. I want that All to right. be on the record. It's about okay? you guys. It's about you guys, the viewers. Awesome. Leaving comments on our YouTube channel. Appreciate you guys and uh, combing through a lot of these comments. And you know, we'll, we'll get into some Kirk Zimmer Spielman kind of macro conversations, but I'm also seeing a lot of the micro conversations, and it seems like there's a good portion of Vikings fans, even after that loss, are taking some silver linings, Judd Zolgad. I'll start with this one from loyal listener, Paul Fertzkoll. He says, I can't be the only one who's barely phased by Dalvin's injury and being out. It's always happening. Just expected it at this point. But I am super excited to see Kane back there. He can probably help show Kurt. <laughs> Where the center oh, is boy. too. Little old talk and shake from my guy. Why you gotta take shots? Oh man! And then uh, another one here from Heartbreak Vikings, uh, but this is not a heartbreaking comment. He says, "I've watched a lot of film on Kane, and overall, we need to get this guy the ball, and he has the ability yes. to cut back and see the holes they are still developing, and does it by setting them up with a really good leg. His vision on the football field is at another level." With Dalvin Cook's injury, Judd, is it time to unleash uh, Kane Nwangu? Yes, well, it's but it's been time for since he got back to create a package of plays. Like he doesn't need to be the bell cow. It's not like oh, he should just play all the time now and get all the carries. Um, he is a a good offensive coordinator slash offensive mind's dream, right, Dex? I, I mean, you you talked about this sight unseen in training yeah, camp. I have, I have a great football mind. I saw him in camp and said, "My God, he never slows down when he cuts." And and the comment that he sees the field well is absolutely true. But like, find different ways to use him. So he doesn't need to be eye formation, right? He doesn't need to be a he could. Move them around, but come up with a package of plays. So, yes, when you can return two kickoffs for touchdowns in 2021, you should not only be returning kickoffs, right? Like, you see that guy play, and you're mm-hmm. like, oh, my God, what an athlete. And, and yes, he seems like... He seems like he's got a real sense, and and we can talk about, you know, well, in breaking down the film, look at that big hole that was open. Oh, guess what? A lot of guys, one, aren't quick enough to, to get there, and two, don't see that, that hole. He does. So, like, extrapolate that to potentially an offensive, um, an offensive set of plays. Yes, he should play more. He should have played more for quite some time. This is where, like, the Vikings offense, the Chargers and Packers game, we saw improvements, but there's so much more. There's so much more here that could be done. And can you imagine the nightmare that Jefferson, Thielen, Nuwangu, Osborne, I don't know, you know, a variety of things. They'd be a nightmare. Mm -hmm. I think if if you can figure out ways to do flea flickers, which is what the Vikings did yesterday, uh, they they had wide receiver passes. They're using Justin Jefferson not just with uh, with to receive the ball, but also to pass the damn ball. I think with the way this offense is trending – and the way they want to open things up more, I bet there will be some K- Kane Nwangu packages that you can expect oh. against Detroit. And why weren't there before though? Right. Like why haven't they done this? And and it's not just like, it's not the execution of of um, the receiver pass. It's the personnel packages that you deploy that make you dangerous. So that's the thing. Anytime Nwangu would be used in a package, it would have to be accounted for. Mm-hmm. And you know what that does? 
It concerns defenses. Right. And do you know what they do then? They're less apt probably to pay attention to other things. Correct. Which creates diversion. So, so, so like, I'm not even talking about run elaborate play schemes. I'm talking about come up with a package of plays that either, A, get the ball in Nwangu's hands, and or, B, create the perception that you might, which is going to create more opportunities for guys like Jefferson. That's what I want to see them do, and that's the common sense angle here. Yesterday for the Vikings, uh, just two snaps on offense for Kane Nwangu. Yeah. Dalvin Cook had 29. Madison had 22. Uh, if I put the over under at 10 for Kane Nwangu next week at the, against the Lions, Judd, would you be taking the over? Would you be taking the under there? I'm gonna guess Madison's the featured back. You know they're not just gonna throw Nwangu out there as no, the starter. Yeah, and and they, I'm not saying that they How should. How about this nine and a half because it's an odd number. A nine and a half over or under for Nwangu for for snaps against the Lions this Sunday. Well, with Dalvin Cook out, for sure, I'm going to say over. I'm going to say about 15 or so. Mm -hmm. Um, But I don't trust them not to say, well, he's just a backup. Right. Like, the thinking is, the way that they approach it will be, well, he's the backup. So, like, yeah, he's going to play. It's like, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about getting creative here. Um, so, So, under the amount of snaps and how I think he should be deployed, but I think with Cook out, uh, I bet he gets about 15. Right? Snaps. Yeah, I, th- I think probably Not touches. Just 10 to 15 is the safe assumption there. Um, he's a special player, man. And, and you know, yeah, this is hot take cop, so I'm sure I could get pulled over for this. But he, like when he you know, he's roaming around the corner and, and running that downhill speed, if you will, it, it reminds me like Darren Sproles. Like, Darren Sproles was this little scat-back fun guy to yeah. watch that was when he was unleashed and utilized. Yeah, why not? Yeah. He 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 could be it. I'm, I If Kane Nwangu ends up having a Darren Sproles-like career, I'm sure him and Vikings fans will be more than thrilled with that. Darren Sproles was a nice player uh, for the Chargers and Eagles and whatnot. But I, I think Kane Nwangu is exactly what the, what this team... It's another playmaker. It's another big-time playmaker that you can just find find out well, ways to, to use. Yes, yes, exactly. And and it causes defenses to have to account for more people, and that's the key thing. Do you have to account for that player? The answer w- with a guy like Kane is absolutely. So, yeah, and Sproles, Sproles might might be a, a, a good cop. Yeah. It might be a really good cop. Maybe I'll be a genius. Maybe, you know, sometimes I, I say right things. You never know. No, I, I like that one. Yeah, we'll see what happens there. Uh, transitioning here, this is from Bad Dad Joke. Uh, Kirk made four bad throws a day, and that was too much to overcome because the rest of the team couldn't rise up. The indictment is not entirely on Kirk, mm-hmm. but he most definitely shares the largest part of the blame. Judd, if you could shoulder all the blame, and we did a pie chart of blame that you can find also on this YouTube channel. Yep. Does Kirk shoulder the majority of that blame yesterday in the loss of the 49ers? I give him a lot. I give Zimmer a lot. I give the offense, um, um, coaching staff a portion. But yeah, he's the most, look, where he is directly to blame is, and I think we talked about this on last week's show, Declan, just because you throw a pick doesn't give you license to freak out and melt down. Mm-hmm. And he definitely did. Um, I'll give you the stats again, because these stats are important. First half. So on the road, tough team. Not a great team, but a tough team. Kirk Cousins. 12 of 17, 147 yards, two touchdowns. Really good. Really good. And I thought, okay, there were times where we saw Jefferson triple covered, Thielen open. So I thought, oh, my God, they're, they're going to have to adjust for Thielen, right, in the second half, and that's going to create uh, possible possible one-on-one matchups with Jefferson. That's going to allow Kirk the ability to throw to him more. Second half – First pass after San Fran scores to take, I believe, a 21-14 lead. First pass gets picked. It's a terrible throw. But guess what? Those happen. Like, I'm not blaming Kirk. Bad throws happen. Yep. Guys get picked. Tom Brady throws bad passes. After that, though, here's where it's here's where it's on Kirk. 8 of 15, 91 yards, that pick. He became pedestrian at best. He struggled at worst. Uh, that's where this is on Kirk. He's paid far too much, and he's far too important. He can't let down. He's got to throw that pick and say, bleep it, I threw a pick. Sucks. Okay, we're right back. Mm-hmm. And instead he checks down. Instead, um, instead, Jefferson, first half, five targets, two catches, 45 yards. Second half, four targets, two catches, 38 yards. Thielen, first half, 
Five targets, five catches, 62 yards, two touchdowns, two tutties, okay? So things are looking great. <laughs> Second half, he's targeted twice and catches none. And I know we can talk about, well, that one got look like a catch. I don't care about that. So basically, Kirk melted down. The offense me- melted down. And the incredible thing that, that you threw out on Purple Daily, I believe, or Phil did, I think it was you, was PFF shows. Kirk wasn't under that much pressure. No. So he melted down. Mm-hmm. That's got to come back on Kirk. Um, but, I mean, I do Do I think that this offense has consistently run well? No, I don't. There's so many different things that you could, could do. But I don't care who I blame. Declan, when Jefferson and Thielen together have six targets and two catches in the entire second half, I don't give a damn who takes the blame. Someone takes the blame. Right. That's why changes are needed. I love it. Well, that's actually, that's a good story from Jackson because Jackson says next week, next week will be the true test on if Zimmer has changed because they didn't get the win yesterday, that to the Niners, and they played a horrible team and they play a horrible team in the Lions. And I can see him going back to his old conservative ways against Detroit. Here's where actually I'll, I'll push back a little bit sure. with Jackson's thinking there. Great question, Jackson. Um, I think with with Dalvin Cook out. And I know Cook's missed time before, and with the Lions being atrocious, no, I, I think the game plan is not keep it simple. It's to to stomp their throats out. That's what I want. That's more yeah, wishful I, thinking on my that. end. You're not getting that one, sorry. But but that's what they should do. They should go out and I mean, absolutely the Lions and, do suck, and so. stomp on on Man Campbell and the Lions, man. Like I I don't think next week is the true test if Zimmer has changed or not. So I, I disagree there because there's still so much football left to play. And actually, actually, the Rams game is going to be great. Now it's going to be really good because the mm-hmm. Rams game, the Rams are beatable, right. very, very vulnerable. And if you look at the Rams game, that's the one because there's going to be like the Rams game. My guess you're going to give up points. Mm-hmm. Question is, will you get in a shootout and outscore them? But I mean that that was a test yesterday. Like I think yesterday was such a good test. And and it played out perfectly. You had the ball late. You had opportunities to tie. And, like, that was the – I know Kirk screwed up, and I know that it was an ugly game that felt bad. But if you had given me that script on Friday, like, here's what they're going to be up against. I would have taken it. Mm -hmm. Down by eight. You can come back and tie. You've got the ball. You're at the three-yard line, Right. Like, wouldn't you have taken that? Mm-hmm. It's a road game. Just get out with a win. Again, I don't care. That one's not about style points. That's about get out with the win. So, like, to me, that was the test. Are you different? The answer came back. It was no. Do you think, though, the the uh, Vikings will go back to their conservative ways against the Lions on Sunday? I don't think so. I mean, I do. Do I think they'll run a lot because they probably can against Detroit? Yes. Um, but, I mean, I don't consider the Lions to be a test. If you lose that that game, you know. You deserve what you get. <laughs> but the Lions are terrible. I, I just don't know what can we take from that game unless they win by 21 and you're like, okay, to what you just said, they stomped on them. But, like, what can we take from that game? Mark says on our YouTube comment page uh, that I was at the game. I flew all the way from Connecticut. It was definitely oh loud and hostile territory. That is a flight, by the way. Uh, Mark, you are. What, I don't know where fan. in Connecticut, but oh, at Hartford, uh, all the way to I mean, that's a five and a half, oh, six yeah, hour across, flight yeah, at least, right? Yeah, cross country. Um, he says, I was at the game, definitely loud and hostile territory, but Kirk just seemed panicky because of it, because of it especially at the end. Yep. He missed some wide open throws, and I yep. definitely felt them go conservative towards the middle of the game. So yep. a lot of other fans echoing that it's nice to get off these nice starts, but also at the end of the day, whether the whether the pressure's buckled or off, they go conservative. Well, and the question about that becomes, does that come down then to play calling or is that Kirk checking down? That's what we don't know, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so like the lack of Jefferson and Thielen being targeted after Kirk threw that pick. Is that them pulling back from a coaching standpoint, or is that Kirk basically saying, I don't trust it now? See, we we don't know on that one. Um, nonetheless, it's a failure of the entire system. Like when you're not throwing, when you base when you after one pick, and a pick that we knew at some point was coming. Like there's no question with the way that the Vikings had cut things loose, Kirk was not going to go the rest of of the season without a pick, right? Like, it was, it, it was not going to happen. So we knew that a bad pick was coming. The question was, how would Kirk and the Vikings coaching staff respond? 
And unfortunately, their response was basically about the 100 percentile of what you don't want. Skull Vikings, who was also at the game. I can't believe he has that trademark on YouTube either. That's pretty impressive. Uh, Skull Vikings says, I was at the game. Great game. Bedlam. Vikings fought and fought. We are depleted. But good game for the Vikings to learn off of. So more silver linings here from, from the game. Is, is that a game the Vikings can learn off of, Judd? Learning's past. I'm okay. Do, I'm done with learning. I'm done with learning. You learned, you learned against Cincinnati. You learned against Arizona. You learned against Cleveland. I'm done with learning. Um, defensively, they were depleted. And that is very true. And that's why the defensive performance didn't shock me. My tune today after 200-plus rushing yards against Declan would be a very different tune if that was uh, Pierce and Tomlinson, right, and Griffin and Hunter. I think, rightfully so, we'd rip them. My guess is they might have gotten gashed some, not that much for sure. But this was a game in which... The offense, which seemingly had learned and had adapted and adjusted, went backwards when they could least afford to. I'm done with, I'm done with, like, who's going to learn? Kirk? He's been around forever. Mm -hmm. Mike? His job's in jeopardy. Like, who's learning here? I have a uh, Oli Udo, couple Oli Udo comments that I'll oh, get into boy. here. Oh, boy, boy. Uh, but before I get into that, Judd Zogad, because if I bring up the word Oli Udo, I think oh, you uh, are grabbing That's... one thing and one thing only. I, I am grabbing a Surly, and let's see as I go through my mental catalog of what Surly Brewing has to offer. What am I going to grab? If you mention the right guard of the Vikings, I know a Surly Furious, because Furious is how I feel when I watch a guy who was moved from tackle to guard. Uh, struggle when we all said he's going to struggle. And and they said, oh, you don't understand. Wyatt Davis can't play. You don't understand. We had this guy. It makes me surly furious. It makes me want to go grab not one, not two, but probably three. And it makes me... It makes me calm mm. as I think about enjoying my favorite IPA, the IPA that revolutionized beer in this town, uh, that really throughout the country. If you have not tried it, folks... Try Surly Furious as soon as possible. If you have, you know the religious experience that you get when you are sipping on a Surly. Don't settle. Get Surly. And in particular, Surly Furious. Paul says the Vikings must do everything they can to ensure Udo never plays another snap as a Vikings as a Viking beyond 2021 sooner if possible. You set up to fail. It's a miracle he lasted as long as he did without going in the tank. He's a tackle. They moved him to guard right before training camp because they panicked about Wyatt Davis. Um, there's a whole story there. I, I don't know exactly what went wrong. I don't know what Davis did or didn't do. But there is no way that you – I mean, why wasn't he moved last March? Why was he – Yeah, give the kid a chance. And you. we just got done what, watching the uh, Drew Samia experience last year, right? Fail miserably. Ezra Cleveland had to be moved from tackle to, to guard. There's this weird um, there, weird football thing that seems to be very baseball-like. Oh, that, that guy's bad? Have him play first base. <laughs> it's like, do you understand first base? Like, I get it. It can be adjusted to, but it takes some time. Yep. You know, tackle to guard. That guy's a Oh, man, just have him play guard. This is the NFL. Right. Have, you, have you looked at the interior uh, guys now? Coming from the defensive line, the the interior pass rushers are really good. I feel bad for them. I mean, yes, it's frustrating to watch the holding calls. Yes, it's frustrating to watch him struggle. But all of that being said, what what did you really expect? Like, he's the weak link. He was set up to be. This is not his fault. This is the scout that signed you, and more importantly, the person that moved you. Corey says three things. Number one. Ole undoubtedly needs to get benched. Two, we showed why Zim and Cousins are done here. Three, the season is over now officially with all the injuries we are acquiring. They need to stop trying to get everyone hurt. I don't know if the season's necessarily over now, Corey, uh, but I, I, I do I do believe with your first two assessments. I'm with your first two assessments. Yep. Ole Udo needs to get benched. I'm with you. And we showed why, uh, two, we showed why Zim and Cousins are done here. Even with when Drew Samia came and like, it was similar. I said, well, he can't be worse, right? But they gave him a chance, and it showed he was worse. Yeah. And Drew Samia is not good. But guess what? They still plugged and played him and said, all right, you want to see how bad he is? or You want to see if this is an upgrade? We'll see. I'm fine with that plan for Wyatt Davis. 
Like, I, I don't want it to be that Wyatt Davis is the next him. Drew Samia. Not active. But at least show me that he's worse. I want to see if he's worse. Yeah. I I don't think that's, a, and I don't think that's me saying, oh, like, oh, you, you don't remember how bad Drew Samia was. Yes, I do. But I'm also watching how bad Ole Udo is. I want to see. I want to see what Wyatt Davis. Can I just do. want to know where the preparation was for that position. I I want to know when you should have Super Bowl aspirations. How you overlook that position? A uh, well, couple more here. Angelo says, "I like this one a lot too." He says, "We don't have a culture. We have a hell of a lot of talent, but we need a coach with some alphas and to build an identity and a culture." Judd, would you say the 2021 Vikings two things lack a culture? One of Pat Royce's favorite words and an identity. I think the I think the second thing they one thousand percent lack, and, and I think we talked about this on Ventline on Sunday, and I think it's a very important distinction. So culture, I don't know what the culture of this franchise is right now, um, but I know this: they have no identity because their identity was defense. Like that was the whole. Mike was hired because of that. He was hired to make this. The Vikings defense was going to be king, and for a while, they probably were. Um, That's done now. The offense is better, but it's not turn loose. So I actually think in this case, the most important distinction, the culture point is, I think, a good point. The identity point, I think, is a great point. Because you you tell me, what's the identity now? It's certainly not defense. Mm. What's the identity of this team? What When you think Vikings— what do you think? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Like, I mean, you should think offense, but they but they resisted that. They resist it. And There's resistance. Yeah, and like they started to give into it, but that's not. But like that's that's an identity that they really don't even want. Yeah, I'll, I'll say this: I don't think they lack a cult. I don't think they're having a culture problem. I I don't think there's. I don't there know might enough be, about they're, how they're working. In, true, true, and in I get words. I get that, and I don't want to put myself in the shoes, but I. I like at the end of 2016, there was a culture problem in that room. The the players was vaulted against their head coach. That was clear. Um, I've and and that was public. But I I don't believe there's necessarily a culture problem in that room. I do think there's an identity crisis in that room. I think it's much more black and white. Well, that there's an identity problem than there is a culture problem. I think the culture problem is part and parcel of, of the fact that the identity problem exists, and there are definitely players who are rightfully so frustrated by by the fact that the Vikings aren't embracing the obvious identity. And so that creates culture problems. But I think it would be ironed out a lot if you had a coach here who said, okay, we've got Jefferson, we've got Thielen, we got, you know, Kirk possibly, I don't know, uh, Cook in 2022. Our identity is going to be as Brad Childers once said to Kevin Seifert, a kick-ass offense. Kick-ass offense. Where uh, I believe this is kick-ass, kick-ass offense. offense. That's after the Green Bay game and when they played so bad oh, on a Thursday night. Kick-ass offense. I love that term. Yeah, they were a kick-ass offense. Uh, last one here, Jed. And it's just more of a, um, I think, and I've seen a couple other comments on this, and this is just more taking your reporter hat on here. Oh, it says, boy. Matthiason says, question for Judd. Uh, during the Everson Griffin situation, Zimmer addressed the media mm-hmm. and – Courtney Cronin asked about his availability for Sunday, and to many people, they thought to ask that that was insensitive to the situation. As a reporter, do you think it was insensitive, and how do you navigate questions like that Mm. when clearly the only thing that matters is the player's well-being? Well, first of all, they don't know. The reporters don't know in real time as much as we do, possibly, because here's, here's what is hard to comprehend. In a situation like that, where he is in his house, your your news side is covering him. So it's not so like the Vikings people then who are at the facility aren't like also out by Griffin's home. So they have no idea. I mean, he could be on, on his way. He could have come out of his house. That question has to be asked. Um, someone was going to have to ask that. I would be far harsher on my brethren if they didn't ask that. Um, We can't worry. Like, that's not... It'd be different if you went to Griffin and said something that pushed him. Like, that's that's, that's a a bad thing. Yeah, Yeah, like if you went to, to Ev and said, are you thinking about this or that? That could be a problem. But in this case, it's so fluid, and the team has to be asked that. 
So, I mean, she did, she asked a tough question and there are going, and you're, you're not going to win that one. Like there are going to be some who are like, that's typical media insensitive. It's a necessary question in yeah. part because in her defense, the people who are, who are at the Zim thing don't know exactly where things stand to. Right. No, I, I think, I think Courtney was, it was very but I mean, well if she didn't ask the it, question. Yeah, she ben had asked Gessling it. Ben or Kramer right, or someone, someone was said, going to. You have to ask it. I, I yeah, I, I think she did the right thing. And and to be honest, you know, it, it's it's so easy for fans and and even like your family members or friends who know you work in this business and they all. Do you ever do you ever talk to the players? Do you ever do you ever talk to the coaches? And you know, in in some roles that where you're a beat writer and and you are covering the team on a day. 365 degree day basis. I mean, yeah, you are identifying more. Where you know, someone like me who wasn't necessarily covering the team, but was covering the game or covering a situation, it becomes a lot more easier to ask questions that I'm I'm trying to ask. And when some people always say like, I want to go in there and ask a player they coach, would. they never would. Yeah, they never would. Dude. And also, when when it crosses, so the interesting line that gets crossed and and where fans are fans and we are technically or not we we are not fans is when you have a news story you got to ask questions and and fans are like why would you ask that of the vikings right now that's insensitive doesn't matter right um the reality is we are ordinarily asking questions and covering a game or like what's your formation going to be right and and there might be some byplay there that is not fun but it's a game uh, the Griffin thing is a flat-out news story. And I can tell you right now from ha- having covered things, when the news folks show up, Dex, it gets a lot harsher than that. It yeah. gets a lot hard When when the Adrian Peterson thing went down and the Vikings came back with, well, he's going to come back and play, that we consider, what, what was Spielman's words, a family situation Some and we're not going to. Yeah. And the newsiders came out, the Kesslers and Housers. They weren't messing around, man, and I'm no. going to tell you right now. And I think fans don't care as much because they're, they're news people. And there's some confusion sometimes about our jobs of like, well, you should be a fan too. Like Pat Kessler ain't a fan. And he's going to ask things. If he had been at Zimmer that day, his questions about Griffin's current state would have been a lot harsher. Correct. And that's just his, And that's just the job. It crosses into an area at times where it's not comfortable, it's not fun, but that's your job. It's the job. And and uh, the the question that Courtney asked, I can tell you right now, if at the very least, a boss from one of those places would have demanded it. I I was I have been told before when, when I was on the beat, you have to ask this question, like you get, like somebody has to, and it might be you, but you've got to ask it. Mm-hmm. And it's questions the fans don't don't like, and that's. I get that, but that's why reporters aren't fans. Exactly right. And it's and you're not and the thing too is you're around those people a lot, but they ain't your friends. No. You know. Mike's no. not your friend. Mm-mm. I I hope the best for Ev, but he he's not your friend. No, he's not. So like you have to you are forced to ask you're forced to ask things and pry where no fan would and they're not paid to. I don't I, blame them. They shouldn't. I would just recommend that if, if anyone is who is watching this or has um, aspirations to get into journalism or get into things that you know that you and I have been able to do is just know your role and know your place, and un- and understand where you fall in that. Like don't don't force an awkward situation because you have the availability and the access to do so. Just kind of know your situation, be act comfortable, and, and act like you've been there before. <laughs> Some people don't know what that means, but just act like you've been there before. Kudos to Courtney Cronin. I think she did a great job. She deserved, um, she she deserved the the right praise for asking that question. So, mm-hmm. I, and a lot of people were asking about it. So that's why I wanted to bring it up. Yeah, that's a, a que- of- that's a question that it, at the very least, ordinarily, your boss says has to be asked. Has to be asked. All right. Well, that is comments from YouTube. Comments from YouTube is always fun. It's always insightful. Sometimes it's more enjoyable after a win. But today, today the reality hit again. So. All right, Alex Boone tomorrow, baby. I can't wait. Oh, Alex Boone on Tuesday. Rhino. He's going to bring it. The, the bleeping rhino, as he likes to call himself. Yep. Um, I'm surprised we actually didn't even get calls from him because I'm sure he's ready to rampage. He's holding it all that in. Rhino. He's holding it yeah, all he's in. He's ready to rock, baby. For Judd Zolgad, Declan Goff, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Daily Minnesota Vikings Entertainment right here on Purple Daily.